and the other co-chair is our dentist, Dr. Larry Huron. So, please. So, one of you, who are you? Yeah. And then I'll <laughs> introduce our moderator. Yes. Um, just a warm welcome to everybody that came out today on behalf of Faith United Church. Um, we're a welcoming and inclusive church, and uh, we believe in compassion and uh, connection and communion. So uh, today we're connecting with Dr. Bargava and, and promoting health and wellness for everybody. So enjoy the day, and God is surely in this place, and hopefully he'll help us to learn. And Dan's going to say a little bit about our facilities now. And my welcome to everybody that's here as well. Thank you very, very much for coming, and thank you for the, your team that you brought and all the professionals that we'll see here today. Uh, just a, a few logis uh, logistics so that the washrooms is just outside in the foyer. There's one right there against the sunroom, but if you actually go into the sunroom, there's two more. So in case you need the washrooms, that's where they'll be. And just to let you know that during the entire forum that we're going to be having coffee and water... So please help yourself. I'm, it's good for your health to actually get out of your seat and go over there and get a cup of water. <laughs> um, okay, so welcome, and I'm glad that everybody's here. Anything else that I have to uh, mention? Oh, the, the nutrition break will be provided, and I thank you very much for the United Church Women, the UCW, for preparing stuff, as well as our own wellness education team. Thank you very much. for. We'll bringing that out about five minutes before the break's announced. There'll be food over there as well. And uh, the other thing, so that'll be at about 11.40-ish in, in the program. And uh, we're very fortunate to have an amazing heart team of presenters in a public education forum like this. And so it's just wonderful to have this every year and don't be afraid I'll be taking a few pictures this time to help promote it for next year as well and so you're all going to be in an album unless you come up and say don't you dare okay so welcome and th on behalf of our wellness education team welcome on behalf of Faith United Church you know where the washrooms are <laughs> well thank you Dan and Larry and uh, so I would like, I would now like to introduce to you our moderator for the day. He's Fred Horvath, and he disappeared from his wife next to his wife, but anyway, we'll find him. Oh, there he is in the back. You know, he let his wife sit in the front. <clears throat> so Fred has been employed in the municipal government for 40 years. He commenced employment with the municipality of Carrington in January 1989, and has assumed many portfolios, including property manager, health and safety office, operation managers, and in 2001 became the director of operations. Fred has served as the president of two national boards and one provincial association and continues to volunteer and mentor with those organizations. He has been recognized by his peers with awards for excellence in professional development and outstanding service. Fred is a senior facilitator and has taught at the University of Guelph. He was also recognized by the Durham United Way for going above and beyond as the chair of the Clarington United Way team, where they increased their contributions by over 300% over a period of three years. Fred is a recipient of several awards for leadership, education on behalf of the Ontario Recreational Facilities Association, as well as the leadership in education from the province of Alberta. The most important thing about Fred is he's a graduate of the Heart Care Rehabilitation Program after receiving a mechanical mitral valve in 2009. It should be noted that Fred passed with honors from the rehab program. And Fred, we thank you for taking the time to help us today with our program, to make it run smoothly, and keep us entertained. Today, he will not only be moderating, but he will also be sharing the story of his heart with us. So, Fred, it's all yours. Good morning. 
you know, I taught at University of Guelph for five days and got home late last night when one heck of a storm was in Guelph during exam period. And I told the class, don't worry, by the time you finish, the storm will pass. And the storm did pass. So in my job at Clarington, I am kind of the part-time weatherman. And I will tell you good news and bad news. And the first good news is the fact is I'm responsible for snow on the roads. You will note there was no snow on the roads for this morning. I will also tell you, based on what we're seeing in modeling, and the fact is it's crazy weather out there, you will see a little bit of winter one more time. I know. I'm just telling you. And isn't it funny that the weatherman's the only person that can be wrong all the time and still has a job. But anyways, I'm excited to be here today. This isn't the first time they tried to get me here. They've tried for the last three years, and just schedules didn't work out. And I'm so happy to be here because you're going to have some great speakers today, and I'm just so excited to be here to listen to them and learn more about it, which is what I want to talk to you about. So first of all, if everybody's just quiet, can you hear it? This is the part where you all nod your head and say yes. So I'll do it again. Can you hear it? Well, that's my mechanical valve. And some people can hear it right away. Some people never hear it. And I've had a lot of fun with it. Number one is when I was getting tested for a fitness program, uh, Rachel will remember, I think it was Craig that worked uh, at their rehab clinic. He was designing and he says, can you hear it? So what are you talking about? I hear a ticking. I don't hear anything. And he's looking. You have a watch. I don't wear a watch. Hmm. I hear the ticking. Of course, I say, someone upset with you guys? Is there a bomb in the building or something? And it would continue on. And this went on for several minutes. And then all of a sudden, I hear it again. It's loud. And I have to tell you, after the first several months, I don't hear it anymore. But my beautiful bride, when she can't sleep at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, she hears it. And it keeps her up, so she claims. So, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that is my beautiful bride, and I'm going to talk to her about her today. She doesn't know that yet. And she'll turn red, and I probably will be disciplined when I get home. But that's besides the point. So anyways, finally he says, you have a mechanical valve. Yes, I do have a mechanical valve. Let me tell you how it all started. 2009, I went for my annual physical. I believe in annual physicals. And I'm a typical male. And I know all the women in the audience will be nodding their heads. I'm infallible. Can't get sick. I'm healthy. Why do I need to go to a doctor? And yes, I sometimes get the man flu that everybody talks about. So I was told on that particular day, I was in perfect health. And I was excited, because I don't want to see a doctor more than once a year. The next day I woke up, and something wasn't right. But I went to work. I I pride myself on being at work every day, and up until that point in time, I never missed a day at work. Got to work and went into the coffee area, and you know how you know your body? I knew my body at that point in time, something wasn't right. So I said, you know, I got to go. I got to go someplace. So I left, got into my car. Still don't know how I did it, but got into the car and went to my chiropractor. I said, I must have slept the wrong way or something. My back is really tight. I can't do anything. And he said, I can't do anything. It's, it's locked. Go home and rest. So I went home and rest. I told my wife, I'll wake up tomorrow and everything will be good. I'll be back on my feet again. Well, that didn't happen. I ended up by ambulance to uh, Lake Ridge Bowmanville where they examined me and provided some medication to me. Went home. It was certainly helped, but it wasn't the solution. And this continued on and off for several weeks, but I finally went back to my doctor who said I was in perfect health, and he said, you have a pulled muscle in your behind. Okay. He said it was very painful. Oh, yeah. So that's the way we we went, and then 
time went on, day after day, week after week, other symptoms started to develop. Number one, I lost 30 pounds. I'm lean, so 30 pounds I became very lean. I would have severe headaches. I had hot and cold spells like you would never believe. The hot spells were unbelievable, and the cold spells were unbelievable. My teeth would chatter for minutes upon minutes, and, uh, and I had no strength. If I had any food to eat, my face was on the, on the table, and I'd have to push it in that way. I couldn't get out of bed, nothing. My wife and I were going to go on a cruise, our first cruise together, to celebrate that plus her mom's 80th birthday. And all along, everybody said, you'll be able to go on a cruise. Two weeks before, I said, there's no way I can go to a cruise. I can't even walk. That was number one. That was the most important thing that happened because when my wife, I made my wife go on the cruise. She brought me a shirt back from the cruise, by the way. I still wear that shirt. And uh, she says, something's not right. I think you're dying. So she called the doctor and wanted me to come in to see him and my wife said, no, we can't go. He cannot get into a car and drive. At that time, my doctor was not in Durham region. It was in York region. So the trip was an hour. So to get me there, you'd have to ice my body, get to the doctor's office, and ice my body to get back home. So I ended up in emergency in Oshawa on the Thursday before Easter. And as you know, most emergency rooms are filled with people. And I thought, oh boy, we're going to be here for three hours probably at least. I was taken in very quickly, put in intensive care, and doctors started working on me. And was told that you're probably not going to get much done over the Easter weekend due to the fact staff's away. We decided to stay in the hospital because that was the best place for my care. During that weekend, I had every test you could possibly think of. And probably because of that, I was saved. Saturday before Easter wasn't the best day of our lives. I was told I was dying. My wife said, I had such a great medical team, which I'll talk about a little bit later. They found it, and they treated me with antibiotics, and I was released from the hospital seven days later. To recover at home, to eat, start gaining weight back, no headaches, no cold or hot spells. I did my follow-up checkup with Dr. Bargava in his Oshawa office, and said, you know, I'm not where I want to be, but let's find out. We found out that my, mecha- my mitral valve was completely destroyed, eaten away by the infection. So what I had was endocarditis, which I know that you're going to ask a lot of questions about that. And it was funny when Dr. Bargava was reading this out to us, he said, oh yeah, you got osteomyelitis. And we said, what? So basically I had two infections. And I became the show and tell at every emergency center I went to because Doctors don't see patients with both infections. So one is the infection of the bone marrow of the spine, which we believe where it started. The other one is the infection and the inflammation of the lining of the heart. Dr. Bargava said, we'll have to do open heart surgery. And, by, you know, we had full trust in Dr. Bargava. He knew the pain and discomfort I was experiencing. He brought a surgeon to Oshawa to meet with me from St. Mike's Hospital, Dr. Mark Peterson, who was unbelievable. Here's the nice thing about the care that we received. At no time was it always directed to me. It was a team effort. Dr. Bargava, Dr. Peterson, my uh, family doctor today, Dr. Uh, Lottering, all included my wife in every conversation. That's important for so many reasons. So we had the surgery, 
in August of 2009, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here nine years later, able to golf, even though Dr. Bergava doesn't think I can golf. I only won this tournament once. Oh, twice. I won it once, twice. I play in a band, never missed a beat. I'm the drummer. Um, I teach. I teach at the University of Guelph. I've been very happy and got a three-year extension of my contract as of this week. And I've never missed a day of work since I returned nine years ago. I'm a lucky, lucky individual. Very grateful for the care I got. And uh, it's unbelievable that the care I received was almost seamless. And the team of, of uh, practitioners I had started with Dr. Bargava, who said to me at one point in time, because I didn't want to go back to the family doctor I had in York Region, I need a family doctor. He says, I'm there for you. You call me anytime, anywhere. I'll be there until you find one. And that was a big relief to my wife and I. Number two, I had Mark Peterson from St. Mike's Hospital, who my wife still thinks he's got the sexiest eyes in the world. And I think went to see me at the hospital only to see him first. But anyways, unbelievable team that he put together. And uh, I hate to say that, I kind of enjoyed being at St. Mike's Hospital. I have Dr. Lottering from Bowmanville, who is an unbelievable family doctor who took care. When I kind of interviewed him to be my family doctor, I said, so have you ever dealt with a mechanical valve before? He says, no. But by the time you come to me, I will know everything about it. I will have a network of professionals that have dealt with this. He has not let us down one bit. And uh, he's been fantastic. He would go on holidays and call me for the first year and say, are you okay? Now, he panics from time to time. We do have challenges. You know, Christmas Eve, several years ago, one of the boys got a new dog, and I wanted to play with the dog, and the paw cut me, and I bled for five hours. The smallest little cut. But I still was able to have turkey, and, and it's funny, everybody has a solution how to stop bleeding. So they were experimenting me on for five hours. Now, if anybody tells you that nail polish will stop bleeding, don't believe them. It doesn't work. It stings. Tea bags is the answer. We found that out. That was the last thing we tried. I don't have a lot of bleeds, to be quite honest with you. I did have dental surgery last year. We had a little bit of a problem. But, you know, I'm alive. I'm enjoying my life. I'm traveling. I'm doing the job that I really love doing, meeting all kinds of people that are volunteers in our community. As I said, I play in a band, I play rock. So at some point in time, if it does get boring today, I'm going to pick up drumsticks and drum for you. The moral of the story, there's a couple of things I want to share with you. Number one, when I was told I had to go to Oshawa Hospital for the first time, I thought, you know, Oshawa? I don't think so. You know, I want to go to the big hospitals. Well, let me tell you, I'm probably the biggest, quietest supporter of Lake Ridge Hospital. Oshawa found it and saved my life. When I went to Bowmanville, because I went to Bowmanville after my surgery for a couple days just to make sure everything was in place, I was treated unbelievable. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, be proud of the people who work in our hospitals in, in Clarington, or in, in uh, Lake Ridge system. Not one of them ever caused any grief to us. They were more than sympathetic, empathetic, and were there to help. Every doctor, every nurse, every ambulance attendant, everybody who takes blood. Like, it was unbelievable. Number two, quarterback your health. Learn about what they're telling you. Understand what they're telling you. Ask questions about what they're telling you. Because every time that we were given information, my wife would go back and look up things. We didn't know what endocarditis was. We have no idea what osteomyelitis was. We didn't know why certain things were reading a certain way. You've got to take care. 
And we know that we all believe in healthy eating, dental, eye, it's all related. And if you don't do your checkups, you're not doing yourself any justice. My last comment to you is, don't forget about the caregiver. The caregiver struggles as much as the patient. I learned that through my experience, that they lived every pain that I experienced and were there for the good and the bad. I can't imagine what my wife went through when she was, when we were just married, I believe three years, and I was told I was dying. And it's, I felt the worst of it because I found the love of my life. So, I will entertain any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. So then I guess your question was about bleeding, right? Yeah, because... Okay. Because of the mechanical valve, see there are two valves, two types of valves can be implanted to replace your own native valve. One is a mechanical valve and it has got, of course, moving parts, but it has, it's mechanical, it's steel and plastic and some titanium and whatever. And the other valve is made out of pig or tissue. And if you have a mechanical valve, it needs blood thinners. And he's on warfarin, and uh, that makes your blood thin. So the nail polish did stop the bleeding, right? I did not know this. I tell you, I learn everything. You know, something every day. So when you cut yourself, which uh, he had injury from the dog, you know, he bled but then stopped. So that's one of the uh, risks that we have, and usually it would stop, but if not, we have to go to the hospital. Well, that's a good question. There's all kinds of theories, and I can give you my version of it. So the pain started in my back. I could not move. I just couldn't move. And we just thought it was back pain. We went to the hospital, that's what they kept treating me was back pain. Lo and behold, when we got to Oshawa, they continued to look for the solution of the back pain and found out about the endocarditis. So what we believe, and again, for all the medical professionals in the, in the room, this is only my understanding because it's so new. I picked up an infection that got into my bloodstream. It settled into the back. It went undetected for a length of period of time. It broke off, it traveled through the bloodstream, and it at the heart. So how would I get an infection? So this is what we think. We were told it takes three things. Number one is, your body has to be stressed. So in this particular case, I live in Newcastle, Ontario. I have a 94-year-old, sorry, not supposed to say her age, 94-year-old aunt that lived in Port Colborne. Never been sick a day in her life. She called me just before my physical and says, I don't feel well, I should go to the hospital. Surprised the heck out of me, I went to the hospital. She was stayed in the hospital for over a 13-day period. I was going back and forth, this was in January, because we're into a winter storm here, so I'm responding to that. So I stress my body out. So we think. I don't believe I stress my body out. I'm a typical male. I can do anything. Number two is I had to have a cold or a flu. Well, I had a cold on February the 16th, which was the uh, family day holiday. Because I remember visiting with her, and I said, you know, I won't get close to you because I have a cold. Number three, 
you have to come in contact with a virus. Where do you pick up a virus? I never gave it much thought. I do now. Hospital. Where was I for 13 days? In a hospital. So apparently if all those three things come together and there's a weakness in the system, you're going to pick it up. So that's what we believe happened. Um, this is why doctors will tell you, they'll put you in the hospital and they want you out as fast as possible. Because there are things that you can pick up in a hospital. Not all hospitals, but it is the likelihood. So that's my read of it, Donna. And I would agree with him. Stress, which decreases the resistance of your body. Of course, the virus and bacteria in the air, you get it. Of course, hospitals are a dangerous place. I know it saves your life too. And of course, I have to go and work there. But I remember this uh, Christmas, I was doing my seven days in the hospital. I will admit patients just with a heart attack. I'll send them home with the influenza A. Proven. Because it was... And anybody who was in the hospital and the nurses here, we were in a gridlock. So the hospitals give you infection. So try to stay away from the hospital if you can. But you have to go, you have to go. So, and then, of course, you, virus infection reduces the resistance for the body. And then the bacterial infection comes in. And he, his valve got infected by a bacteria. And because virus itself does not destroy your valves, it is the bacteria. And I looked up his chart uh, last night. He had a, a, a bacterial infection called strep, mitis, not strep throat, inf but a different one, but basically a streptococcal infection which uh, affected the valve, kind of destroyed the valve, made it leak, and he was in trouble, and then, of course, we found the problem and got it treated. Questions? your um, dental pro uh, recently. Uh, what is your monthly ideal INR and did your dentist suggest you lower it to avoid the bleeding? Great question. So first of all, my range for INR, hopefully everybody knows what INR is about, is 2.5 to 3.5. I would give you my version of how INR works, but I'm going to ex let the expert talk to you about INR. So when we did... Uh, meet with the periodontist, we talked about that scenario, about A, stopping my, my warfarin before the surgery, or just keeping it intact. So I did a, a test before I went for surgery, and I was in good shape. So they said, we're not going to do anything. It was uh, 2.8, which was no problem. I vary between 2.6 to 2.9. Now, I was saying to Dr. Bergava today, Friday night, I did a test before I went away for University of Guelph, and I was 1.9. And I have to tell you, all the alarms go up, because once my doctor finds out, he's going to be calling me right away. So I said, I can take care of this. I'm going to play with my warfarin a little bit and do another test. And I did another test, and it came back at 3.2. So I've been as high as 4.3 in nine years. And I've been as low as 1.9, which was last week. So we had the surgery, and we talked about it. And he says, you know, if you start to bleed, we're just going to, we'll, we'll stop the surgery. Didn't bleed at all. So I was happy. So I got a crown work done. That was what was happening. Tuesday, so it was a Monday. Tuesday comes by. Everything's fine. Soft foods and all that. Wednesday, I don't think I tasted as much blood as I did in that particular day. And it continued to Friday, at which time I went to the hospital and they put something on it and solved the problem. So, yes, I probably should have dropped down on my warfarin, but it's always a problem when... So anytime I have to have a procedure, I may have to stop my warfarin for two or three days in advance. And to get back, and to get back on track, can take me probably 10 days to two weeks. But we get there, so... Do you want to talk about INR? Uh, just to add to this INR, INR is a blood test which is done periodically in patients who are taking warfarin, which is a blood thinner. Warfarin is also known to the public as a rat poison because it's in those little pills. And it thins the blood. And when we say the number, 
let's call it two. It means it takes twice the time for your blood to clot compared to a normal person who is not taking blood thinners. So when he says the ideal number for a mechanical valve is between 2.5 to 3, it means that if he were to cut himself with just shaving or whatever, it will take two and a half times than compared to a normal person to stop the bleeding just with pressure. So the blood is thin, so it's the blood thinner. Now we of course have newer drugs uh, which do not need this high NR blood test monitoring, but they are being tested. They are not yet been approved for use in patients with mechanical valves. But the day is coming, then he will just have to have take one tablet or twice or two tablets and no blood testing. Yes! Oh, sorry. I'm sure he's waiting for the day. In fact, when these new drugs called Noax, uh, Eliquis, uh, Epixaban, uh, Rivaroxaban, Zeralto, if some of you are taking them, you don't need blood tests. And uh, when they came out, we were so excited as physicians, wow, we will not have to send our patient for this INR testing. So, and we have got two minutes here, I'm told. Uh, One more question. question. Um, uh, is there a procedure using stem cells for uh, a valve replacement now? So the question is the center. Stem cells. Stem cells. S stem cells. Is there stem cell re research that will help with uh, valve replacements? I still did not get the question. I'm sorry. Um, stem cells. You know, stem. Oh, stem cells. cells. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> The question is about stem cell. Can stem cell transplant or something like that, can we regenerate the valve? I guess that's the question. Well, believe it or not, I had a patient who, <clears throat> whose tricuspid valve was totally destroyed. And his, you know, when you put the valve, you know, valve you put in a the hole in the, well, this passage in the heart, So this is the valve. This is the mitral valve, a healthy, nice tissue valve, and it sits in a ring. Here's the ring here. So this patient's valve was totally destroyed. I send him to Dr. Vivek Rao, who is the chief of cardiac surgery, who comes to our clinic as well. And he said, well, we'll see what we can fix him, because his, this valve ring where the valve is supposed to play had dilated so much, there was no valve that can be um, uh, put in. So he devised, there's a, a little membrane which is a stem cell magnet. So what he divided, and this was the first one of its kind in Toronto General Hospital. He made, the, the sheet, it came like this sheet, a little piece of paper, and he folded it like this, and he attached it to the valve ring. And then the idea is, this is a stem cell magnet, and the stem cells come, and wherever you put it, like black magic or whatever, this thing will transform into a valve where it could be. And they put stem cells and they put these, uh, if you put it on the nose, and nose has been chopped off, it has been chopped off, it grows into a nose eye. So, he, okay, he's telling me to get off the microphone. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, this stem cell uh, technology is not being used, but it is there. And this patient, lived, he left the hospital, and I was doing this transversal echoes to see, to see in, with my own eyes, you read things in, in science fiction magazines, to see if this valve, trans, how does it transform into a tricuspid valve? And of course, he was, it was working, but, but then ultimately, I think he moved away somewhere, so we lost him to follow up. I would still try to, now I remind, we'll try to track him down somehow. But yes, stem cell technology will be used one day to put it where he needs a valve uh, and it will grow into a valve or where we put the stem cells. Okay. So one, we have one more question. One more question and uh, yeah. Regarding the INR reading before surgery, some doctors would suggest if you get an extraction or something, to lower your INR, you have to take something like heparin and you have to inject the needle in your stomach. Have you heard of that? 
You mean the blood thinners uh, given in the belly injections? Okay. So I think what your question is that if you are on a blood thinner like uh, warfarin and you need to go for some surgery and the va we cannot really stop the blood thinning but we have to stop it for at least a day or so. We call it bridging or anticoagulation or bridging. So we stop this, give you the needles which keep the blood thin but the needles when we stop it within 12 hours or 24 hours the blood becomes normal, surgeons operate and then we produce. So that's called bridging anticoagulation. So we have ways uh, to um, tide you over crisis if you are on blood thinners. Okay. So Fred, here you go, you can take over. Okay. If anybody else has any questions you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, my wife and I went the same journey together so we can ask her because she is here for the day. You, you are staying for the day, right, honey? And, and myself. And we we're pleased to share our story, talk about uh, the journey we took. At this point in time, I wanted to introduce our next speaker and uh, comes from Coburg today. Dr. Mukesh Bargava is an internal medical medicine specialist with a practice in Coburg. He has been in practice for 21 years. He attended medical school at Gandhi Medical College in Bhopal, India. His postgraduate training was at North Shore University Hospital in Forest Hills, New York. After finishing his training in New York, he practiced in Maine for 16 years before moving to Coburg. He's now chief of staff at Northumberland Hills Hospital. His practice interests include internal medicine, cardiology, diabetes, and vascular neurology. One of the biggest titles that he has is he's the younger brother of Dr. Rakesh Bargava. Can you imagine having Christmas dinner with the Bargava family? Like, what would they talk about? Like, they're all specialists in their fields, outstanding specialists. But anyways, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rakesh Bargava. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Okay, let me see. We're just working on the uh, situation at hand. Luckily, he's good at talking, so he will entertain you. projecting for some reason, but we'll see. Oh, that is good. Everything was working too. presentation on our uh, screen here, but not up there for some reason. So, maybe it's just you or... Okay, you want to do it? Well, while he's fiddling with it, any questions that we can answer? He's going to talk about shared decision making. Maybe I'll give the introduction here while he fixes it. It's very important, as uh, Fred said. 
the, the, your caregivers, your physician and nurse caregivers, it's nice to make it a shared decision. And this is where you need to have your family involved with you and make sure they go to the appointments uh, with your doctor, especially if you're talking about uh, whether it's cancer treatment or for surgery for your valve. It's nice to um, have somebody else listen to you and ask questions. And uh, would you agree with that, that your visits with, to the doctors was helpful? And uh, um, any questions? So, do you want to… So, can you sign in and then… then I'll... Oh. So, while he's uh, working on seeing if it gets started, how many of you have heard about shared decision-making in the past? A couple of people. Um, shared decision making you know in medicine when, when doctors and patients need to learn the same thing at the same time that, that is when it becomes challenging because in medical schools residency training we are talking about telling doctors how to practice shared decision making but on the same time when you are the patient when I am the patient I want to have shared decision making. So let's see if this gets up, otherwise I'll just walk through that. Okay. There's something better there. Okay, so I will do it without it. I'll just put it here so I can see what I'm talking about. So I'll walk, imagine that you are starting to have some symptoms. This is three weeks ago, you started to feel that something was just not right. And you felt unwell, just like Fred said, he woke up, suddenly he had a problem, but I'll walk you through a typical heart patient. They say, I don't feel well, I have some uneasiness, but it goes away. But when I do something, I don't feel well again. Then it progresses a few days later that you're having chest discomfort and you start to get worried about this. As time goes by, you wonder what to do. If you are, as Fred had said, a typical male, you think, gee, this is nothing, this is heartburn, I ate pizza, I ate that. And you try, try to walk yourself through the most benign condition or you self-diagnose. You may take a pill. Then this person says, you know what, it has been going on for a while, I should talk to my spouse about it. That is the usual next reaction. And that is what this person did. He said to his wife, you know, I have this, I've been experiencing some heaviness, I just don't feel well when I do things. And they said, well, we should go see the doctor. And then you figure out, do you go to urgent care? Do you go to emergency room? Do you go to your doctor's office? Do you call a person who you knew who had similar problems? And you make a bunch of decisions what to do about this. After you've done this, suddenly you end up, or you know, you might say, I can't put up with this. And you've also decided, you've made a decision, I need, really need to eat healthy, I need to start exercising, I need to do this. And as you start doing this, your problem gets worse and one day you show up at the hospital. Any hospital, pretty much anywhere. Um, so that is, thank you, thank you. See, that is what family is for, right? <laughs> you mess up your presentation, they fix it for you. So, you make certain decisions, and this is what I've been talking about, and the clicker is right here. You decide whether you're going to call 911, whether you're going to drive. Again, 
lots of decisions. Now you start to share these decisions with your family, with your friends, with your spouse. And then you come up with a decision. You come up to the emergency room. You meet a nurse there. And there are some in the room, that you'll see more of them. Great professionals and they say, okay, is this person high risk, medium risk or low risk? We suddenly start to triage you. Just like probably Fred does, you know, how big is the snowstorm? What do I need to deal with? Right? So we triage and we figure out, and this is the traditional model where we say, you know, we have triaged you, we have, it, and it doesn't project well. Then somebody comes, examines you, you have tests done, somebody reaches a diagnosis, right or wrong, like, you know, in Fred's case, back pain, pull muscle, uh, this is what it is. So you come, with, come up with a diagnosis and you're told of a plan. We have a plan. And in this case, this gentleman's plan was, you're having chest pain, this is likely angina, which is decreased blood supply to the heart. And I picked this example not because it is unusual, it is a very usual example, very usual story. And the doctor says, well, we can do a bunch of things and we can observe you. And the, um, sorry, it doesn't show well, but we can observe you, we can see you, we can admit you, we can do an angiogram to you, we can give you medications. And depending on who the doctor is, what mindset and what resources are available, whether it is the Easter weekend or it is Monday morning and there's a slot open, a lot of uh, factors influence this decision. So a decision is again made, you're told uh, that, you know, the doctor comes in and says to the gentleman, I have good news and I have bad news. You didn't have a heart attack, but I think you have angina. And I think you need medications, but I think we can also do an angiogram and we can figure out where those blockages are and we can fix those blockages for you. And guess what do you say? Show of hands. If you were this person who was having chest discomfort, your doctor told you, we can do a bunch of tests, and I think this is angina, uh, I, I think we should do an angiogram, which is putting up a catheter, and we should see where the blockage is, fix it. What would you say? Let's go do it, right? Okay, you have identified a problem, you are a qualified individual, you have come up, and you've told me that is the root. He says, well, we can also uh, try to treat it with medications. What would you say? Pardon? What do you recommend is one answer. What else would you say? Pardon? Fix it. You have a problem. You can see it. There's a blockage. Fix the problem. Right? And as you will hear from speakers after me, doc, uh, like Dr. Narini, that the blockage is just a problem. It is like the pothole in the road that the town can either patch or they know that it is a surface problem and you still need to redo the surface or figure out why you have potholes. But you had a blockage and your doctor tells you, I think you have a blockage. So you, you, if you were in the hospital, they say, well, you got to go see another doc uh, doctor for this. We'll discharge you and, or follow up with your family doctor or follow up with Dr. Bhargava at heart care and we'll figure out what to do. But at some point, you may or may not have an angiogram done in this journey. And this is the traditional model that will happen. What I'm going to share with you in the next probably five to ten minutes and hope to change some of your minds here is how you can share in this decision making and change the outcome. And you will do that with me as we do this exercise. So you had the same story, now you come to a doctor who says this is the traditional model, doctors are trained to do this, they, we call this the SOAP model. Subjective is what you tell me, objective is what I find out, I come up with an assessment and I come up with a plan and I share the plan in probably five to ten minutes with you and say, these are the options, let's make it happen, I'll refer you to blank or take this pill and 
So in shared decision making, here's what changes. So I, what you do is rather than say this is the plan, you say to whoever, whether it be the patient, the patient's family, extended family, you say here are the options. And you don't stop there. The options are not just like, oh, we can do a stress test, we can do a nuclear stress test, we can do a CT angiogram, we can do an angiogram. You also give comparative information on what these options will change. And that is what you would do is you sh share the options, the comparative outcomes. So what will happen if I t just took medication? What would happen if I didn't do anything? What would happen if I took medications and got a stent put in? Wouldn't that change how you think about the decision you make? And again, these are decisions that can only be made if you, are, are, you have the time. We are not talking about you have a major heart attack and then can we have the shared decision making. This is more about elective. So this person has been diagnosed with angina the doctor told them, they also let's throw in that they had an angiogram and they have a couple of blockages. And the doctor said, well, I can give you pills only or I can give you pills and we can put in a stent. And most of you said, fix it or tell me what to do. Right? So if I told you putting in a stand in a person who did not have a heart attack and just had angina. And they had angina that they walked from here to the parking lot. They said, you know, I had a little bit discomfort, but I could carry on. That putting in a stent or an angio, uh, putting in a stent will not change whether they had a heart attack or their risk of death. So that part is out. We, we are not saving... Uh, or preventing a heart attack or death by putting in a stent in a person having angina. So that is the first th fact that I told you. And then I told you that if we put in, if in 100 people like you, we put in a stent and gave them medications, in the first box there, uh, after one month, only you will have 65 people who will do just fine if they were given medications. Another 11 people will need to have something more done and another 24 will have no difference. Whether you put in a stent or stent plus medication or medication alone. And then after six months, the difference narrowed that 78% it didn't matter whether you put in a stent or not, they would have the same outcome. And at one year, that number grows to 88. So the benefit keeps on increasing. So you got a message that if you put in a stent, if you were having an angina attack, it will decrease, or in the short period, it will help you get your symptoms better. But at one year, not that much of a difference that you said up front. Does that give you give anybody a pause? Should, should I get a stand? Should I not get a stand? Then we say, okay, these were the benefits that we will help you. We'll help you quickly by putting in a stand, but at one year it might not be different because your body has also healed and you have, may have made lifestyle changes and others. So he said, what are the risks? if we put in a stand or medications alone. So the first one is if there were 100 people, we, didn't, we took them and didn't put in a stand with the same symptoms, 14 will need a stand at some point in the next one year. 80, 86 will not. If we put in medicine plus stand, seven people will need another stand. So the difference is roughly seven people out of 100 that if you do uh, a stent and medication. So if you tell this to the patient and then you tell them, 
Here's the downside of putting in a stent, that two out of 100 will have significant bleeding, or one will have a complication because of the stent we put in will have heart attack or death. And during the first year, and this is while you're putting in the stent or within the first month. At the end of the year, we will find three will have a bleeding event because we had to put them on additional blood thinner, and two will develop a clot that forms in the stent. And they will need more treatment, and 98 will not. So there is risks and benefits that you explain to the person in fairly simple language. So what you're telling is that yes, we can put in a stand or give you medication, but the difference might be less than 10% and 90% of the time or 80% of the time, you might not need this procedure. Depending on how old you are, and depending on what are the... Um, other things going on in your body, you may make a different decision. One size will not fit every person. So if doctors started to tell this information to people up front, if patients decided to ask for this information up front, we will have better outcomes. Now how do I say that? Is that my personal opinion? Or is it said in the literature. So people have studied this because everybody has an interest in this space. You have it, I have it, the healthcare system and the government has it because are we at times treating more or treating less than what is needed? Wait times in, in our province are what they are and time may fly and if we say one month person could be waiting for an angiogram for an elective procedure at times, depending on holidays and other. They're trying to improve that. But the bottom line comes to how do you actually make this happen when you go to a doctor's office? And when should you even think of shared decision making? So the areas not to think of shared decision making is when you have an acute emergency. You are in a car crash, you are having a major heart attack, we know what to do, we know it has been well studied. But when it comes to taking a medication forever, having elective surgery, having a test that has risks, whether it be an angiogram or cumulative radiation, if somebody says, oh, get, just go get a nuclear scan, that has a fair amount of radiation with it, and radiation can cause problems. So here's how I would say uh, that you should proceed with shared decisions. When the doctor says, and I'll just take the example of my brother, if he says to you, you should take this pill for diabetes because it is great, or you should take this pill for blood pressure because your blood pressure is elevated. And you ask him, so if I took this pill, yes, my blood pressure will come down, but what will it really change in my life? Am I going to live longer? I'm going to decrease the risk of stroke? Um, what will happen? Or if I didn't take this pill, what will happen? And we as doctors should be able to tell you in common terms in saying, you know, if I treated 100 of you, it is called the number needed to treat, how many will prevent a stroke? It is not that every hypertension person that we treat, we prevent a stroke. The number is somewhere around 50. For every 50 people that I treat for high blood pressure, for a few years, I prevent one stroke. So it is not as straightforward, and we as physicians will think, may, had started to think as medicine became more advanced and depersonalized, we made patients a process. As soon as you entered the hospital, you were a person waiting to have something done. Oh, this person, he has positive markers, he had a heart attack, he's He's on the list to have an angiogram, and then you had an angiogram, then you had a stent, and then you had the next step. We got to start taking a pause, and this is where I am. That is why I'm here talking about shared decision-making. This is the future. This is the future for what will differentiate good doctors from average doctors, good practices from average, 
and better outcomes because it needs to incorporate the person going through the test. When you go to the dentist, like most of you have been to the dentist and there's a dentist in the room, I saw him somewhere right there. They give you a treatment plan. They say, here are your options. You can get a crown, you can get a bridge, you can get this, this is what will cost you, etc., etc. Here's what will happen. I think in, in medicine when we treat people, we need to start doing this much more actively in plain and simple language for patients. So has anybody done this? Where, where, is this just my thought? Is it just the literature? Or has somebody really done this? If you go to Mayo Clinic's website, or if you Google shared decision-making Mayo Clinic, they have dedicated an entire website to this. Which doctors can use for some specific conditions at the moment and plug in the patient data, and it will tell compared to the current literature, what the outcomes would be. It is true comparison based on statistics, based on evidence that is out there. Should, which diabetes pill to take? What would be the pros and cons? So I know I'm getting the signal that I need to stop talking, but it is something you should think about more. We are thinking about it more in our practices on developing tools that we can easily share. Because in the practice of cardiology, diabetes, and neurology, we see pretty much the same thing over and over again. Um, and there might be more, no more than 15 or 20 diagnoses. And pulling out these tools to tell you what difference will it make will change the outcome. And each one of you will decide differently. So I'll take questions there. And thank you. Go ahead. Right. I was a lawyer, I don't need this. <laughs> really concerned about the OHIP schedule of fees. How much time does a schedule allow you to spend with a patient? Right. Excellent question. So the question is, can this, I'll you know, rephrase the question, do doctors have enough time to do this? Right? That's your question. Will the fee cover it? Will they be rushed? I have tried this, and I try it on a regular basis. It takes you actually less time than you think, but it doesn't delay you a whole lot. If I had these graphics that didn't project well right there, this is how the Mayo Clinic people do it. They have just on a piece of paper, he says, you have angina, these are our options. You have diabetes, these are our options. And you take out simple things that are up to date, and are relevant and people can understand. So to answer your question, yes, if you, are, if you think through this, you can make it efficient. But even bigger than that, forget about the OHIP schedule. Each one of us, each of the physicians who are speakers, people who, anybody who's in healthcare, sooner or later, we will be a patient if we are not already, not already one. I can guarantee you there is nobody in the room who says, I have never been a patient or I will never be a patient. It, it is very unlikely. So we are doing this for ourselves because we have to advance medicine. We live in a country with one of the best healthcare systems. We got to make it better. And the way we make it better is by utilizing the information that is there. So I don't see an alternative option because otherwise we will bankrupt the system if we just kept on doing tests. Uh, so. I'm, don't get the flavor that I'm saying, don't put in stents. You need to put in stents, but you need to understand that the person getting the stents should be a part of the puzzle, not just the doctor saying, you have a 80% blockage and you have angina, so you should need a stent. That is not the answer. It, it should be customized and tailor-made. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, I had the widow Yep. I think that probably the stent is the only option there, would it not? Absolutely true. So there are certain reasons, and that is where when the doctor comes up with a diagnosis, it, the gentleman said, I had a widow maker, which is if that artery gets blocked, you have a high chance of dying because it, it supplies such a big area to the heart. So sure enough, we call it left main disease, 
And if you have that, people would say, you know, not even a stand, because if while putting in the stand, you are in the 2% people that that stand will get clogged, we will, that will kill you. So we, the people used to do pure bypasses just if you had a blockage in a critical area. So that is why I'm not saying make this decision on the Mayo Clinic website yourself. Have your dream team, as Fred had, I call he had a dream team of his family doctor, his cardiologist, his surgeon, his rehab people, the nurses, the EMT, the nurses. That is the dream team you're talking about. But participate. Don't just go home and Google because that may lead you down to a different path and you come back to the doctor and you say, I read on Google and then the doctor is trying to just get you off what you read but the time is uh, spent in getting you off rather than getting you to the right track of what information you need. So ask for the pros, ask for the cons, ask for outcome data in simple language and the literature is starting to publish that for you. Any other question? Okay, great, thank you. He forgot to mention one member of my dream team, my wife. She's my dream team. Yes. You know, it's important uh, what Dr. Bargava said in terms of the Internet. We can find all kinds of things on the Internet. One of the things that I found after I had my mechanical valve, I was doing nothing, so I was surfing the Internet. And I found all these stories that were scaring the heck out of me, people that had challenges with mechanical valves. And it really worked me up. I'm thinking, what did I do? But more and more, it formed questions that I could ask. And I went to Dr. Bargava and, and Mark Peterson. Dr. Mark Peterson answered my questions. The stories I was receiving was mechanical valves sometimes don't work. Well, I can tell you that in all the later research I did, mechanical valves do uh, work. 30, 35 years, some of the people that I've been reading about and connecting with. So uh, it's important. Be careful on the Internet. But I did like that presentation. So, Dr. Bergava, excellent. Just so you know, if you're not aware of it, that there are healthcare education uh, sessions going on in May and June. Uh, on May the 8th at 4.30, Mind and Body Connection and Heart Disease, speaker Dr. Bargava, who's an internist. This is all the Bargava family here, right? <laughs> On May 16th, which is a Wednesday at 4.30 p.m., heart disease is more than just clogged pipes. It's a disease of inflammation. And the speaker is Dr. Rakesh Bargava. On Thursday, May 24th at 7 p.m., when the past is always present, speaker is Dr. Ron Young, who's a psychotherapist. May 31st, 4.30, Herbs and Spices for Cleansing and Detoxation. Speaker is Dr. Deepa Bargava, ENT Surgeon. Thursday, June 7th, 4.30, Healthy Mouth, Healthy Heart. Speaker is one of our speakers this afternoon, Dr. Sanjay Gande, who's a dentist. And on June 14th at 4.30, Medications for Heart Problems, What's New? Speaker, Dr. Rakesh Bargava. And Thursday, June 21st at 4 p.m., the benefits of exercise. I believe these are available in the back of the room, uh, Dr. Bergava. These are great seminars. I went to them the first year when I was uh, able to and found them very exciting. We're good. Okay. So the next uh, speaker I would like to introduce is Dr. Natalia Baziak, who is a very specialized ophthalmologist. She's a retinal surgeon who is truly one of a kind here in the Durham region. She has patients lining up to see her, coming all the way from Kingston and Peterborough to receive her specialized care. She received her undergraduate degree, medical degree, and her residency training in ophthalmology from the University of Toronto. She completed her surgical fellowship in, at Louisiana State University in 1989. She's been working at Lake Ridge Health since 1990, and the chief of ophthalmology, ophthalmolo 
I need a coffee. Since 2012, she was a recipient of Lake Ridge's Most Outstanding Physician Award in 2012. Not only is she incredibly accomplished, she's also a great humanitarian, and she volunteered in Johannesburg, South Africa, during apartheid in her medical school days. She was also part of a medical mission in 1991, post Chernobyl, in Ukraine. There she assessed radiation-induced cataract in children. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome this incredible woman, Dr. Baziak. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, so I have to tell you that my street was the one with the big felled tree. There was no power. So, um... I didn't know that I was going to get out of my driveway this morning, but thank God the crews came out at 5 in the morning and I heard all this noise in the street and finally they created a, an area for, for us to be able to drive out of the street. So there you go. That's my exciting story for today. So um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good day. Um, thank you for coming on a beautiful Saturday. My presentation is going to be a lot of visual stuff, so thank God the slides are working. Um, this is a heart talk, and so when Dr. Bargava came and said, Natalie, come and give us a talk about eyes, I thought, hmm, you know, this is, a, this is the wrong part of the body. But having said that, it's not the wrong part of the body. Because many of you have, who have ever gone to see an ophthalmologist, and some of you who have come to see me, are often surprised because you come in with whatever complaints you have. And then I turn the conversation around and say, so tell me about your blood pressure, and tell me about your cholesterol. And I think that probably some people are surprised, because I'm an eye doctor, not a heart doctor, and I shouldn't, why am I asking these questions? But there's good reason. So we're going to move forward and start with moving the slides forward, if I can make them go forward. No, I guess not. Uh, so we're going to stay on the first slide. <laughs> I can take the, her, uh, this thing out, right? Sure. Okay, sorry, just a second. Don't make them disappear, because I'll be very upset. <laughs> oh, it's uh, not going in smoothly, but it will in a second. Well, now we there have we magnification. Yeah. Uh, well, no, we, it's way too big. Shrink it. Yeah, thank you. Good. Ah, excellent. Okay, good. And you can do that. So, <laughs> what can we learn from the eye? And why are, you know, what is it that we look at? So we look at eye diseases. So we, we can look about glasses and contact lenses, refractive surgery. You know, everybody's heard of somebody who's had a cataract. We know about people using drops for glaucoma. But we also know about retinal disease. So what is retinal disease? What is a retina? And retinal disease, the retina is the back of the eye, and I'll, I'll be showing you pictures of that. But retinal disease can tell us about what's going on in the rest of your body. And I know when my first ophthalmic assistant applied for a job, and I said to her, what do you know about retinal disease? And she said, nothing. And she said, but later on she told me, I figured that when you, a retina specialist can't be very busy, so therefore it's probably not a bad job to have. Well, boy, was she mistaken. So what is the favorite complaint that people come in with? They come in with, I'm blurry. I can't see clearly. Things are not as sharp as they should be. And what I want to leave you with, the message I want to leave you with today, is not just about your new glasses, okay? So if, you, if nothing else you remember today, it's not just new glasses. So eye doctors. Everybody's gone to an eye doctor. They've seen an optometrist. Maybe they've seen an ophthalmologist. Maybe they've seen a subspecialist in cornea, glaucoma, retina. But what is the difference? Do we know? Does, does the average person understand the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist and then a subspecialist? So an optometrist is a doctor of optometry. They go to, most of them study in Waterloo in Canada, but they can study in the United States. They are able to diagnose disease, prescribe glasses, and now in Ontario they're allowed to treat some diseases and prescribe drops. But they are not medical doctors, and that's the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. 
So an ophthalmologist is an actual medical doctor, somebody who goes to medical school just like everybody else. We do an internship just like everybody else. But then we spend another five years specializing in eye diseases. So we are not only eye doctors, but we are also doctors. We understand medical disease. We understand how it impacts our eyes. And then, to add to that, we add some subspecialty training. I personally am a retina specialist, so I specialize in the back of the eye, but there are many other subspecialists. It could be cornea people, glaucoma people, cataract people, pediatric people. But basically, the important thing to remember is the difference between optometry and ophthalmology is that we are actually medical doctors. So what does a retinal subspecialist actually see? And they do not see safety pins in the eye. But you know, I was trying to figure out how to explain to you how microscopic things are. So if you take a look at this picture, and do we have a pointer on here that I can use? Yes. That's an optic nerve. The optic nerve carries all of the nerve fibers from the retina. So the light hits the eye, goes through the pupil, and goes right to the retina. And this is the retina. This is what I see when I look inside your eye. This is an optic nerve. There's probably 12 million nerve fibers that travel in that optic nerve. That optic nerve is 1.7 millimeters from top to bottom. So take a look at my little millimeter gauge. 1.7 millimeters is less than 2 millimeters in size. Now, the end of this safety pin is probably the size of one of these veins, which is about 163 microns. And there's 1,000 microns in a millimeter. What I'm trying to tell you, you don't have to remember these numbers. There's no test at the end of this. But what I'm trying to show you is how small these blood vessels really are. This is a very normal looking retina. So ideally, we want everybody's retina looking like this. Optic nerve, blood vessels. This is the center of division called the macula or the fovea. It is half a millimeter in size. That's what gives you your 20-20 vision. So what happens when you have a disease? What kind of things can happen? What does the retina subspecialist see when they look inside when there is a problem? We can see changes in the blood vessels. We can see narrowing. We can see swelling. We can see all sorts of abnormalities. We can see diabetic changes. I'm going to show you pictures of this so that you can get a visual, because ophthalmology is very visual. And what are the causes of these problems? And one of the biggest problems right here is high blood pressure. I guess that's why Dr. Bargava asked me to speak today. Increased cholesterol, narrowing of these uh, carotid arteries right here, an irregular heart rhythm, diabetes, various inflammatory diseases, and then there's a whole slew of other diseases that can affect the blood vessels in the eyes. So let's take a look at this. As you can see from this picture, this totally doesn't look like the other picture that we saw of a nice, normal optic nerve. This is a hugely swollen optic nerve, many hemorrhages coming off of it. This person came in with blurry vision. They thought they needed new glasses, but instead they got sent to me. They did not get new glasses. They had a stroke of their optic nerve. When I say a stroke of the optic nerve, they had a blockage of the blood supply. Here's another uh, picture. Now this is hard to see because we don't have enough contrast here. This is a nice optic nerve, looks pretty good. But look at this white, pale area of retina. It's not getting a blood supply. This is a normal color, and it would show up much better if we were in a much dimmer room. But this is a stroke of a blood vessel right here, and this whole section of the retina is pale. There's no blood supply. So this person came in complaining of a missing blotch in their vision. And that was the reason for the missing blotch. Now take a look at this here. This is another stroke of a blood vessel, a stroke of an artery, a branch retinal artery occlusion. Or basically, you can see that these vessels are nice and red, filling with blood. And look at this. Look at this white, fatty tissue that is totally blocked off the blood vessel. So the beautiful thing is that as an ophthalmologist, when we dilate those pupils and put those horrible drops in that leave you blurry for the next three hours, the bottom line is we can look inside. We can see these blood vessels. These blood vessels tell us what's going on in the rest of your body. Because if this is happening in your eye, 
There's no guarantee it's not happening elsewhere. Here we have uh, a person who came in also with loss of vision. Loss of vision because look up here. Look at this blood vessel. This is a central retinal vein occlusion. So basically they have blocked off their major vein that takes blood from the eye. And all of this here is blocked. It's white. There's no blood going through it. It would be like taking an elastic band, tightening it around your finger, and watching your finger fall off. It's the same with this. The eye, the retina, is not getting a blood supply. This is, again, um, something we call um, these little white fluffy things around the optic nerve. Those are cotton wool spots, or areas of retina that are not getting any kind of a blood supply. And look at this. Look at these hemorrhages scattered all around here. And all of these patients who come in, they all complain of one thing only, blurry vision. It can be sudden, it can be gradual, it can occur over time. Patients often, and they all, you know, it's very, actually very interesting because I have patients who come in and they've had this problem for possibly three months and I'll say to them, so why weren't you here earlier? And the answer is I was waiting for my annual appointment with the optometrist. Lesson to be learned, if you start noticing a big change in your vision, don't just assume that your glasses are getting blurry, old, scratched up, you need a new pair. Maybe you need to get on the phone and call that optometrist to get seen sooner so that they can make the diagnosis and then make the referral to the right doctor. Look at what happens when this person had very high blood pressure. They didn't know they had high blood pressure. They were functioning along, doing their usual thing, gardening, golfing, doing all the regular things. And all of a sudden, one day they woke up with many black blobs in their eye. They went to the emergency department, and lo and behold, their blood pressure was 200 over 110. They didn't know that. They weren't having headaches. But look at all these hemorrhages that occurred in their eye. And this is another situation with Again, all of these hemorrhages here and abnormal blood vessels on the optic nerve. This is a little bit more subtle. This person didn't actually know he had a problem. He came in just for his regular routine eye exam with his optometrist. Didn't feel he had a problem, and yet here you can see that there are areas of bleeding which are not apparent here. So he's had something that we call a branch retinal vein occlusion, so not the whole a uh, vein was occluded, just a small portion of it. And this is, again, a young lady who came in. Certainly we wouldn't have expected her to have high blood pressure, but she had some kidney disease, which she also wasn't aware of. And she came in with blurred vision, and this is what she showed up with. So a blocked blood vessel and a whole area of, of retina here with no blood supply. Just to give you an idea of what we do, so when you go to see an ophthalmologist, they look at this, they say, ooh, you have a blocked blood vessel, you had a stroke in your eye. And they order something called a fluorescein angiogram. And I think this angiogram is very interesting because basically what they do is they inject a yellow dye in the vein of your hand and take pictures of your eye as the dye travels through. What you'll notice is in the bottom portion of this eye, the vessels, the blood vessels fill up nicely. The white dye actually stays in the blood vessels. But look up here. These blood vessels are unusual. They show us that there is an abnormality in the blood vessels. And this is a branch retinal vein occlusion. But this is very similar and indicative to what could be going on when you have a stroke. So, you know, what do we do in these situations? This person had a blockage of a blood vessel right here, originally. And back in the day, of course, we only had laser treatment. So this is what an eye looks like after it's been lasered. Here is the blocked blood vessel, and the whole area around here was lasered. This leaves a permanent scar. Any doctor can look at that and tell you immediately, oh, you've had laser treatment in the eye. This stops the bleeding decreases uh, abnormal blood vessel formation, and maintains vision. Laser generally did not improve vision. Now, one of the major diseases that is also impacted by high blood pressure cholesterol is diabetes, and we see a lot of diabetes. Diabetes is becoming a national epidemic. 
for various reasons, and Dr. Naridi will be talking to us all about those various reasons, no doubt, specifically diet. But this is what a diabetic eye often looks like. This is, these are the people whose blood sugars are not always best controlled, and in some situations, they have been well controlled, but they've just had the diabetes for a long time. We can see these fatty deposits in the retina, and these fatty deposits tell me that the blood vessels are leaking. So these blood vessels are leaking. But it's not only about blood sugar. It's, all, it's also about your blood pressure. Because I always say to my patients, if you have bad plumbing or old plumbing in your house, and it's sort of, you know, the, the, everything is OK. But if all of a sudden you have a huge surge of water that pushes through those damaged pipes, then those pipes will burst. And that's what happens with diabetic retinopathy. The pipes, the blood vessels are bad. But then you add the increased blood pressure, and all of a sudden, you get the hemorrhage. And a cotton wool spot is another little white spot that we see in the retina in diabetics that tells us that that area of retina is not getting a blood supply. This, unfortunately, is not a good picture for this room because we cannot see these very white blood vessels in a diabetic. But I will show you a flu the fluorescein angiogram, which goes with this diabetic. This lady has all of these little abnormal blood vessels right here. And when the dye went in to her, um, into, the into the arteries and the veins, look at how these abnormal blood vessels are leaking. These abnormal old blood vessels actually are very problematic because, first of all, they leak locally, but then they cre create a major hemorrhage, and you lose vision. This is what a lasered eye looked like back 20 years ago, where when we had no other available option outside of laser or surgery. I will just leave the diabetes for a second. I will also show you a picture of macular degeneration. Now, why am I showing you macular degeneration? Probably all of you know a friend in the room who has macular degeneration. But why is it important? It's important because we do know that high blood pressure and atherosclerotic heart disease is the modifiable risk factor in progression of, medical, of uh, macular degeneration. So genetically, you may be predisposed to macular degeneration. But in order to prevent this massive hemorrhage, one of the modifiable risk factors in macular degeneration is high blood pressure. So, we're in a new era. I showed you pictures of those lasered eyes, but now we're in the injection era. So we have three drugs to choose from, Lucentis, Ilea, and Avastin. And as you can see, all of these eyes are just desperately waiting to get their eye injections because now patients are getting injections on a monthly basis every four to six weeks for diseases that affect the blood vessels in the back of the eye, including macular degeneration. So in conclusion, what would I like to tell you? Blurry vision requires further assessment. Do not assume that my appointment's coming up in four months, I'll see my optometrist. That is probably not great. Control your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your blood sugar. And many vascular diseases can often be identified and recognized in the blood vessels of the retina. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yes. I'm great. Thank you. So, um, again, we're in the province of Ontario, so we have, um, I believe we have a physician shortage, and I'm not here to talk politics. But the bottom line is that... Um, Yes, you can get a referral to an ophthalmologist from your family physician, absolutely. Uh, the problem is that um, family physicians do not have any kind of eye equipment in their offices and are not able to really make a diagnosis. So it's very difficult to know um, for most ophthalmologists whether the problem that's being referred is the appropriate problem for their type of practice. So ideally, um, we prefer referrals from optometrists because they can at least do a triaging 
they can do um, a diagnostic, they can figure out where your problem lies so they can direct you to the right ophthalmologist. Because the problem is that if, you know, somebody sends me a patient and says, retina problem, which I get those, and it turns out that they have a cornea problem, that the patient's frustrated, equally am I, because then I say to them, well, you have to go see a cornea specialist, and they're looking at me saying, well, why did I wait three months to see you? So, yes. Yes. Right. So glaucoma is a disease that does not always require surgery. There are many options for glaucoma, starting with drops, lasers, surgery. Um, again, as Dr. Bargava spoke earlier about shared decision making, I think the important thing is that you have a discussion with your eye physician, your eye doctor, your optometrist, your ophthalmologist, whoever you're seeing, as to whether the eye drops, which is usually where we start, is enough for you, or whether there are, there's progressive damage that may require further treatment. So this is, it doesn't always mean surgery. Sometimes it does. Yes, it can be, because if you have one of these eye strokes that I showed you, there is not enough blood supply to the eye. So what the eye then does is it starts growing new blood vessels. And those new blood vessels cause the pressure to go up. So yes, it can be a secondary event. So glaucoma can be either a primary event or it can be a secondary event. Yes. So the disease doesn't travel. But for instance, if you have diabetes, obviously the two eyeballs are attached to the same body. So the likelihood is that you're going to have similar damage in one eye versus the other. The same holds true with something like macular degeneration. Most commonly, we see macular degeneration in both eyes. It is uncommon to, to have one perfect eye with an eye with macular degeneration. But these vein occlusions, these eye strokes, they can occur in one eye only. It does not mean that you will get it in the other eye. Go ahead. So family history is actually really important, and very often with retinal disease, especially retinal tears, retinal holes, retinal detachment, family history is huge. Glaucoma is another um, factor that we need to be aware of, and macular degeneration travels in families. There's no question. So bottom line is, 
being aware of your family history and making your doctors aware of your family history is absolutely key because that could very well point to where you end up in the long run. Now that you said that uh, about traveling and families, I was adopted and I don't have any history. But um, I did have a question. My, um, my brother, who was not adopted, uh, was just diagnosed with dry macular degeneration. And I just wanted to confirm something that I think I heard you say, and that was that it can be caused by high blood pressure and heart So basically, disease. there's two components to, dry, to macular degeneration. There are the genetic factors, which we do not control because we don't pick our parents. So those we inherit, mm -hmm. and that we have to live with. So we have the genetic predisposition to start with, but we have modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors consist of A, not smoking, B, controlling your blood pressure. C, eating leafy green vegetables with lots of lutein. D, wearing sunglasses and UV 100% protection all the time. And E, exercise. So those are the modifiable risk factors in macular degeneration. And I, I was looking it up on the um, Mayo Clinic, um, and I did see something about eye vitamins. I didn't even know there was such a thing as yes, eye vitamins. there are vitamins, high-dose vitamins. Um, which are available over-the-counter, no prescription required. The most important component of them is lutein, L-U-T-E-I-N. You need at least 10 milligrams a day. There are, pre there are um, various companies that produce them uh, based upon the ARID study that came out of the Wilmer many years ago. There was about a 25 to 30 percent reduction rate in progression of macular degeneration. So Vitalux, Preservision, lutein, um, those are all things to consider. So is that something we should all be taking? or No, I don't think we need to all be taking high-dose vitamins because they too have their side effects. So one always has to remember that for everything good, there's always a bad thing. But the modifiable risk factors we can all do. Right. So we can exercise, control our blood pressure, not smoke, wear sunglasses, eat lots of leafy green vegetables. Okay. Those are all easy. Thank you. We have one last question for you over here. Good morning. Um, is it true that flying and the air pressure affects the eyes? Only if you've had a gas bubble put in the eye by me when you have a detached retina. But otherwise, um, usually um, the change in uh, pressure as you go up in the air does not really make a huge difference. But let's say you've had a procedure done by an ophthalmologist where you've had a detached retina or a torn retina and you've required an expandable gas injection, then you cannot fly. That is correct. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Dr. Bazia, what an informative uh, presentation. At this point in time, I'm going to ask Reshma to do a mid-morning stretch break. Well, we only have one presentation left before the nutrition break, but it's important to keep, you know, our blood flowing. So, um, I realized I had to modify some exercises so that you can all stay in your seats and not knock the other person out. So, we can start with just some shoulder rolls. Just some shoulder rolls for me. Okay, that's good. Now, can we do your right ankle? I'll mirror you. Right ankle. All right, other ankle. Okay, that's good. Now we'll do a little neck stretch. Okay, try not to hurt anyone next to you. If you want to put your head over just above your ear and pull slightly, keep your shoulders down and look forward. Nice little stretch there for those of you who took a little nap. Okay, we'll switch over to this side. I'm impressed my dad has stayed awake. All right, you're going to have everyone stand up for me. Okay, we'll do some calf raises. You want to go up and down, up and down. Stomach muscles in. Excellent. And the last one, just shake your hips a little. A little hula dancing. You guys look great. All right, Fred, we're ready for you. You can have a seat. We'll continue. Reshma, I'm tired. Jeez. <laughs> I did some of them. You weren't watching. Our next speaker of the day is Dr. Phil Narini, a.k.a. Dr. Phil. 
is a practicing plastic surgeon in Durham region that has dedicated his time over many years to educate himself on the associations between diet and disease. With his infection, infectious personality, he loves to share the secrets of healthy longevity. Today he will discuss what is best diet for humans and how this can and will reverse your heart disease. He's a graduate of the University of Toronto School of Medicine and has a master's degree in science. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He's also received certification by the American Board of Plastic Surgery with certification of added qualification in hand and microsurgery. Most recently, he's the alumnus of the Hippocrates Health Institute in Florida and a graduate of the E. Cornell University Certification Program on Plant-Based Nutrition. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our own Dr. Phil. Thank you. So this is the fun part of the day. I don't want to talk to you for 20 minutes and then you ask me questions for 20 minutes. Let's just have a conversation. Let's have some fun with this. So first question is, because I want to get to know a little bit about you, because now you know a little bit about me. So question number one, is everybody awake? Show of hands. Okay, who's awake? All right, everybody's awake. Excellent. Uh, next, how many people in the room have high blood pressure? How many people in the room take pills for high blood pressure? Is it the same people? Okay. How many have diabetes or take pills for diabetes? Is anybody pre-diabetic? No. How about cholesterol? Does anybody have a problem with cholesterol? Or take pills for cholesterol? So I think we've got pretty much everybody in the room covered. All right? Oh, there's one in the back saying, no, I'm good, I'm good. So does anybody in the room have heart disease? So I would beg to differ. I would imagine that if we actually tested you, that pretty much all of you have heart disease. And the reason I say that is that if you take soldiers that are killed, unfortunately, in the war, that are healthy young Americans eating a wonderful standard American diet, 99.9% .9 have fatty streaks in their blood vessels. And 99% of them have coronary artery disease. They may not know it, and you may not know it, but I guess you do. So let's assume, just humor me for a moment, that we all have a little bit of, high, of heart disease. Would it be nice if we could reverse that heart disease? Show of hands. Would it be nice? And if I could tell you, we'd put him out of business and Dr. Bargava could retire. And if I could share with you today a way to do that, would you at least, at least think about doing it? Would you? Everybody would agree. Okay, excellent. So we're all on the same page. Now I'm going to sweeten the deal a little bit. What if we add, for those who think they don't have heart disease, prevent and reverse heart disease? Would that be a pretty good idea? All right. And who wants to be heart attack proof? In other words, never have a heart attack again. Because I'm going to quote somebody who said, a very um, well-rounded physician who said, and listen very carefully, heart attack and heart disease need not exist. It is a toothless paper tiger. And I'm going to prove to you today, I'm going to share with you today, not my opinion, but science and data to support everything that I say, and if I say something that you don't believe, I want you to ask me and challenge me, and I'll try to answer that. So I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to share with you science and data to show you that we can actually do this. So before we go on, I want you to read this with me. And it goes like this. I can prevent and reverse my heart disease and become heart attack proof. Okay, all together now? So I can reverse my heart disease and become heart attack proof. You got it? You can all leave now. Okay, so a little bit about me. So, yes, I have a master's in all those letters, and I have more letters after my name than I do in my name. As does Dr. Baziak, I counted. She has 14 and 13, so congratulations. And I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to make myself better than you. I say that to tell you that none of that has taught me anything about diet and disease. So all those 20 years of training has taught me nothing with respect to the association with diet and disease. I started my medical practice in the year 1980. It makes me feel old, and the gray hairs are all deserved. 
And I've been doing this for almost 40 years now, and none of that has taught me anything about diet and disease. So if a doctor gets up and tells you what to do with respect to your diet, you probably want to wonder, does he really know what he's talking about? So why do I feel qualified to be here today? Because I've done these things on my own. So I've taken the time to educate myself, educate, that's a better word. So I've taken time to educate myself over the last seven or eight years on this association. And I keep learning, because what we know today, we may think differently tomorrow. And as one of the Dr. Bargavas uh, talked about earlier, he was talking about data on stents. So the data on stents now isn't what we knew 10 years ago. And the data in five years from now might be different. So we need to keep learning and reviewing and understanding. So I just noticed as I was waiting to get up here, over here on the side, if you turn to the right, it says, with open hearts and open minds, there's a welcome place in this place. So I ask you today to have an open mind and listen to what I'm going to share with you. So my story is this. So I was having a happy, healthy life, and I met this cute girl, and she was really fit. And she's now my wife, and I'm very proud of that. And I had more than 50 birthdays. And I realized that I was saw, what I saw was happening to my friends, I didn't like. And because you turned 50, it was normal to take a pill for this and take a pill for that, maybe a vitamin once in a while, and yeah, exercise a little more and cut back on these things. But I didn't think that that was the way we had to be. And I realized that information is power. We're going to get back to that. So I made some changes in my life. And then by some people's opinion, I went extreme. So what do I do? And this is what I do. I eat a whole food plant-based diet. That means that I don't buy foods that are in packages. I don't buy processed foods. I don't eat junk food. So that's what I eat. What does that look like? No refined carbohydrates, no feathers, fins, or furs. If it comes from feathers, fins, and furs, don't eat it. Whole grains, legumes, fruits, and nuts, teas, herbs, and spices. And the rule number one that I have to share with you is it has to be yummy. So never sacrifice yummy for healthy, and never sacrifice healthy for yummy. And if you're taking notes, write that down. All right? Because if it ain't fun, and if it's not yummy, you're not going to do it. So that's what I do. And some of you are sitting there, yeah, but I eat healthy. I've been told that I need protein, and milk is good because it has calcium, and fish are important because there's good fats in them, and they have omega-3s, and maybe you've heard about this low-carb business in the paleo diet. And I just watched a documentary the other day on ketogenic diet. My wife says, do you want to start eating meat again? Because we watched this documentary. And it was very convincing. And sometimes you cut the skin off your chicken, and maybe the Mediterranean is a great idea, or the Atkins diet. Don't be fooled. All of these, all of these, did I say all yet? All of these are disease-promoting and life-robbing. Does anybody know what happened to Dr. Atkins? Anybody know? He died of a heart attack. So if you'd like to follow in their footsteps, by all means, it's up to you. There should be sound with this, and there should be a video playing right now. So anyway, if the video doesn't play, that's okay. Uh, so it's a commercial, and the commercial is on Ensure. And the reason I put this up there is because it's heart-friendly. And it's a commercial on Heart Friendly Ensure. And it plays and it's nice and they've got the little bottles, bo bottles dancing. And they're trying to sell you something. And the reason I put it up there is that if it has a commercial, you probably don't want to eat it. Has anybody had Ensure before? You, some of you have been in the hospital, I'm sure, and you've had Ensure. Or maybe you've had Boost. Or one of those other protein drinks. Or smoothies or energy drinks. Or you go to the store and you buy those big buckets like the weightlifter because protein's good for you, right? Well, it's not. So, this is what I had for breakfast today. It's the top picture. It's my oatmeal made with water, not with milk, and fresh fruits. And I added some herbs and spices because they're good for me. But, if you wanted to have Ensure instead because it's fast and it's convenient, this is what it has. And if you can't read it, I'll read it for you. Water, corn syrup, made from genetically modified corn, of course, Sodium caseinate. Does anybody know what sodium caseinate is? Because if they had said casein, I would have known, but they hid it. So I actually had to look it up when I read that. So sodium caseinate, we'll come back to that. Sucrose, so sugar. Canola oil, which is toxic. Soya protein, eh. 
short-chain fructoligosaccharides, corn oil, milk protein concentrate, calcium beta hydroxy. Should I go on or should I stop? Is that health food? So let's get back to casein. What is casein? Casein is the major protein found in milk. Dr. Colin Campbell, PhD, spent his whole life reviewing the associations between diet and disease, particularly how does protein cause disease. This is what he has to say about casein. The main protein of cow's milk is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. Who would like a nice cold glass of milk right now? And you're told to drink your milk because it's good for your bones and it's the perfect food and let's share it with our kids. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. And this is the problem, is information. So we have never had more access to information in our lives than we do today. Never has man had that. But the problem is you don't know what to do with it. And you don't know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. And 50% of the information on the internet, I can guarantee you, is there to mislead you, like the Ensure commercial. The other 50%, you've got to figure out whether or not it's true or not. And that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is getting the information, which you all have access to, and try to figure out which, what should I believe and what should I, should I not believe. And I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of gray hairs in the room, because with that comes wisdom. So not only do you need that information, we, talked, we heard about Google before, so let's Google and get the information. But now, what's really true and what am I going to do with that information? So again, if I say things to you today that don't make sense, I want you to challenge me. Extreme. So I used the word extreme before because people look at me and they say, well, yeah, I can't do what you do, that's too extreme. Well, to me, this is extreme. Cracking open somebody's, open somebody's chest, right? And Dr. Esselstyn says, some people think the plant-based whole food diet is extreme. Well, half a million Americans a year will have their chests opened up and a vein taken from their leg or their arm sewn into the coronary arteries. Does anybody think that that's extreme? Anybody? When I'm going to show you that we don't need this anymore. I feel like an evangelist up here. It's awesome. <laughs> we don't need this anymore because we can prevent and reverse cardiac disease. We can prevent and reverse coronary artery disease. We can prevent and reverse peripheral vascular disease. Why are you here today? I'm going to guess you're here because of this, because you have a risk of something bad happening to you, whether you've had a heart attack or a stroke, or Dr. Bargava says you better come and listen and learn something because it's going to make you healthier and prevent you from having a heart attack or stroke, or maybe you're diabetic, or maybe you're just curious. But really, it's about management and mitigation of risk. And Dr. Baziak nicely said a few minutes ago that, you know, you might get bad genes, but there's modifiable risk factors. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So if you drove your car here today, there was a chance you could die of a car crash, but you wore your seatbelt, you've got your summer tires on, your car's well-maintained, you've got good brakes, you drove at the speed limit, you did everything you can to try to prevent something bad from happening. Why don't we do that with our bodies? Why do we just take a pill and hope that that's somehow going to mitigate or modify those risks? And you know what? Those pills will. But I was looking at the other presentation before on shared, um, shared, shared decision-making, and there was that one poor guy who died getting a stent where the doctors were trying to help him. And I felt bad for that one guy. Now, 99 did okay, but why should we have to kill that one to help the other 99? So it's about risk factors. That's what we're talking about. And cats always get so, hey, we're following the cat theme today. So, Dr. Baziak, again, she already talked about this. So, yeah, but my family history is horrible. My mother's diabetic and she's obese and she takes pills for hypertension, cholesterol, and, and diabetes. My sister is obese and has diabetes, thyroiditis, and, and irritable bowel syndrome. My father died of cancer. I might as well pack it in, right? There's no point getting any long term savings bonds, right? There's no point. It's game over. I can't change my genes, but I can change whether or not those genes are turned on and off. And that's a whole topic called epigenetics. We're not going to talk about it today, but I just want to tell you that 
Don't blame them for what you have caused you. Don't blame them for what you have caused. Because if you have heart disease, and I bet you all do, you've caused it. Not your genes or your family. So, the key message here today is you've caused damage to this. This is the endothelium. This is the lining of your blood vessels. Now, this could be the vessel, this is a heart vessel, but it could be the vessel in your eyeball. It could be the vessel going to your brain. I don't know if I can say it in this room, but it could be the vessel going to your penis. Um, And if it looks like this, guess what? When the call to action is going to come, the flag ain't going up. You can try taking a pill, but it's just not going to work, right? Because there's no blood flow. And I don't want my coronaries to ever look like that. Now, if they look like that, probably not much bad is going to happen. Other things aren't going to work so good. You may not think so good. You might get a little dementia, the flag again, the, the, you know, that thing, right? Here's the real problem. And some of you, I guarantee, are in this situation right now where you've got some blockage with a plaque, and if we did an angiogram, we'd show some blockage in the vessels. And that's where you're at. So you might get a little short of breath or whatever, but then that day comes with the big snowstorm and you go shovel and all of a sudden there's a rupture in the plaque and a clot forms and then boom. And hopefully you get to see Dr. Bargava as opposed to the mortician. So how do we protect those blood vessels? There's a thing called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide lubricates and dilates the vessels, prevents stickiness, vasodilation, avoids the arteries from getting thick, prevents blockage, prevents the smooth muscle migration, which causes the blockage, and it destroys the cells which are inflammatory. Where does nitric oxide come from? It comes from arginine. Through a nitric oxide synthase produces nitric oxide. So you say, well, just go to the store and get some arginine, right? Drink it, eat it, it happens. It doesn't work that way. It actually has the opposite effect. Now, if you eat protein and have oxidative stress from oils, it blocks that. So I could stop right here and say, if you're listening, if I eat protein, a diet rich in protein, and a diet that contains fats and oils, I block my nitric oxide synthase, it's game over. Well, how do we get this to work better? And we heard it from Dr. Basiak, chew leafy greens. Leafy greens will produce nitrates. In your GI tract, we get conversion to nitric oxide. So chewing leafy greens increases our production of nitric oxide. The foods that destroy your endothelium are any kind of oil, feather, fish, and fowl, refined carbohydrates, including our beloved maple syrup, and unfortunately, caffeine from coffee. Now, what if we actually did this? So if we took 200 patients, which Dr. Esselstyn did, and he brought them in for a five-hour education session and said, eat plants. Don't eat oil. Eat what I eat. What happens? Well, most of the patients listened, 177, and these are all people that have had a stroke or a heart attack. Okay? So they had heart disease. He followed those patients for an average of almost uh, three and a half years. Only one patient suffered an additional event. The people who listened but didn't do, 62% went on to have another event. So 99.4% success rate in the prevention of a secondary cardiac event. I challenge any of the Bargavas to put their heads together to come up with any drug that comes anywhere close to that. Guess what? There's no side effects to this. Guess what? It tastes yummy. It saves you money on your grocery bills. And it's fun to do. I'm going to tell you a quick story, and then we're just almost done. So this is Dr. Joe. He's a colleague of Dr. Esselstyn. He was 44 years old when this happened. And he was having a bit of tightness in his chest. He was pushing the lawnmower, and he's feeling a little uncomfortable. So he went to see a cardiologist. They did a full workup on him, found nothing. Three weeks later, he's writing his post-op orders, and he had crushing chest pain. They immediately rushed him to the cath lab, because he's at the Cleveland Clinic, it's the world's famous place for heart disease, rushed him to the cath lab, they catheterized him, he had a cardiac arrest on the table, they resuscitated him, and this is what they found. So big, long, anterior descending disease. And they said to him, uh, sorry, we can't stent it because it's too long and it's too distal, and we really can't do a bypass, so take some pills. 
So with a tear in his eye, he went to visit Dr. Esteston, whose office was just down the, 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 the hall. And just note, this was November 1996. And Dr. Esteston said, guess what? Come to my house for dinner. I'll show you what to eat. And Dr. Joe listened, and he did. And this is what happened. So when he had his follow-up angiogram, he went to visit Dr. Esselstyn, and he had another tear in his eye, except this was a tear of joy. He says, I just had my new angiogram. Look what I found. Look what they found. Nothing. So this is complete reversal of advanced coronary artery disease in about a year and a half just by eating a plant-based diet. So the moral of the story is people with advanced cardiovascular disease with totally, who totally transition, totally transition to a plant-based diet can halt and reverse their disease. Shouldn't we be outside now shouting this to everybody on the streets? Shouldn't we? I'm going to read this again. People with advanced cardiovascular disease who totally transition to a plant-based nutrition can halt and reverse their disease. Don't forget the word totally. And why do I say that? Because people say, well, you know, a little bit of this is okay. Everything in moderation is okay. So when I left the house tonight, I didn't, today, this morning, I didn't say, honey, I love you, but today's moderation day, and guess what? It's my cheat day. What would she say to me? <laughs> she wouldn't say, that's okay. A little bit of moderation is okay. So I love my wife totally. I love my body totally. I do this completely. There is no room for moder moder moderation because moderation kills. So either you do this and you totally transition and you can go from that to that, or you don't. One last thing, Reshma. Uh, one last thing. So, if we can, and now some of you are saying, yeah, but where do I get my, what's the answer to the question? What's the end, end of the story? Where do I get my protein? Where do I get my protein? You told me to eat just plants, right? Well, virtually no nutrient in animal-based foods that are not provided by plants. And if we compare equal parts of tomato, spinach, lima beans, and peas and potatoes, 500 calories, versus beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk. So let's compare what plants offer, compare it to plants. Plants versus animals, all right? What do we get? If you want cholesterol, eat the animals. If you want fat, eat the animals. If you want protein, they're about the same. How about beta carotene? Whoa! How about fiber? Zero compared to 31 grams. How about iron? 10 times as much iron. Calcium? Double. Do we need to eat animals? Do we need to drink milk for calcium? Do we need to eat red meat for iron? And where do you get your beta carotene? And where do you get your fiber? So all those things are essentially not available in an animal-based diet. So plants is where it is at, is at. This is what I want in my diet. I don't want this stuff. So why do we eat what we eat? Because it's fun, because your friend invites you out for pizza and beer, because it's cheap. I would submit to you that, again, never sacrifice yummy for healthy or healthy for yummy. And just to make it real clear, don't eat these things, feathers, fins, and fur. All right? And this is what's left. What's left is whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits. But that's boring! Right? That's boring! So I made a list. I went to Wikipedia, and this is the list of vegetables that I found. And then I tried to make a list of meats. And this is what I could come up with. And I had to add squirrel and dog and horse and guinea pig in there to get a long list. And I'm not sure if alligators have feathers, fins, and furs, but I wouldn't want to eat one. Questions? Microphone. Anyone ask questions? Yes, sir. Red wine and? Soy. Soy. Soy, okay, soy is one of my favorite topics. Red wine, I can't, I'm not going to stand up here in a house of worship and lie to you. I have the odd glass of red wine. I'm Italian. I grew up with my dad being told that a glass of wine a day is good for you. There is no nutritional benefit to wine. Alcohol is toxic and evil. Do I occasionally have a glass of red wine? I do. It's probably less than once a week. It used to be, if you talked to me 10 years ago, oh, yeah, a glass a day with dinner, sometimes two, maybe a bottle. Right? Now, okay, um, but there is no tr nutritional value, and if you're trying to cut calories, remember every glass is about 250 calories. So you can have two pounds of spinach or a glass of wine. So if you're trying to cut calories, right, 
It's two pounds of spinach or a glass of wine. Soy. So soy has got a bad rap because of estrogen. So people say, oh, soybeans. Don't eat soybeans. We've got estrogen. If you actually dig deep and look into the estrogen story, the soya actually stimulates the good kind of estrogen. So it turns out that like cholesterol is a good and a bad one. So eating soy is not bad. The soy that we eat, non-genetically modified. So just make sure it says non-GMO on there and eat all the soy you want. Uh, so it's not a problem. So soy is good, healthy, tempeh, and so on. Uh, what is your opinion of organic food versus non-organic? And okay. is the um, chemicals and pesticides that they use in vegetables defeating the purpose of what you're talking about to some degree? Yeah, fantastic. I love that question. So what's my opinion, he said, on organic food? And I'll give you my opinion. My opinion is this. If somebody labels the organic food, at least they've thought about making an effort to make it more healthy. Am I convinced that buying an organic banana is better than... Am I convinced that buying an organic banana is better than a non-organic banana? No, I'm not convinced that there's much difference. Uh, organic doesn't necessarily mean pesticide-free, so you can still have organic pesticides. And when I was buying um, some food for one of our pets, uh, the, the, the guy in the pet food store said the organic food actually has more pesticides than the not organic stuff. So I don't think that answer is there yet uh, as to is organic dramatically better. Do we buy organic all the time? No. Do we mostly buy organic? Yes. I'm not going to pay $7 for an organic cauliflower. I'll pay $3 for the regular one. As far as pesticides in our food, is that hurting us? Absolutely. And you can look at science to answer that question. So there's actually been studies looking at the potential harmful effects of pesticides in vegetables. And the theory, the thought is that the risk is somewhere between six and 10,000 people may be harmed by that. But the overall benefit of eating a plant-based diet is massive compared to the potential risk. So yeah, even eating vegetables has a potential risk, but it's far outweighed by the benefits. Yo. I just wondered your opinion on nuts. Nuts. OK, great. Love that question as well. So nuts, you need to read the package, number one, if you're going to buy nuts. Because a lot of nuts don't contain just nuts. So you got to read the food labels. And that applies to any food that you're going to buy and bring home for yourself or your family. Because if you read the back of the package and it says nuts, and then the next ingredient is safflower oil, canola oil, palm oil, or any other oil, put it back on the shelf. So if you're going to buy raw nuts that are unprocessed, unsalted, probably a good idea. What I showed you with the Dr. Esselstyn program, their program is zero nuts, zero avocados, zero processed foods, zero oil, zero fat. So if you truly want to prevent and reverse heart disease, nuts are a bad idea. Why? High in saturated fat. And most of us don't sit down and have two or three almonds. You sit down and you have a bag or two, right? Right? So it is one situation where when you actually speak to Dr. Esselstyn, he says, you know, maybe a nut once in a while is OK. And there are definitely, definitely health benefits to some nuts. But if you're trying to reverse heart disease, absolutely not. Right? So it's a long-winded answer to say, don't eat nuts. If you really are going to eat nuts, make sure that they're raw, unprocessed nuts, not roasted and, and fried in oil, because a lot of times they are, unsalted, and then go from there. I've been reading some information lately on uh, blood types make a difference on the diet. I'm sorry, which? The type of blood. Your blood type diet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? So there was a time when, when if you're a type A, so I'm an AB positive as my blood type, so I should be eating certain kinds of foods, and, and old people eat things. So this was a, a thing, and it sold lots of books, and it's been totally discredited. So there's no, there's no place for that. So it doesn't matter what your blood type is. You've got to eat plants. Simple answer. Okay, we have two last questions, so one here. Yeah. What is your opinion on algaes? What's your opinion on algaes? Allergies? Yeah. Algae. 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 Oh, okay, algae. So where, where do fish get omega-3? So people say eat fish because it's got omega-3. Where does it come from? It comes from the algae they eat. So yeah, um, algae is a great food supplement. Uh, there's one called E3 Live, which is fantastic. It comes from Kalamata Lake in the, in the U.S. Uh, do I eat algae regularly? No, but occasionally I do. Um, I don't think the problem is there isn't a supplement that's going to make you healthy. There isn't. So don't be looking for supplements that are going to make you healthy. It's a lifestyle. 
It's a food choice. Every time you open your mouth, you have a chance to pick food that's going to make you healthy or might be yummy. So, Yeah, so sea vegetables are very healthy. Absolutely. We have dulse almost every day, wakame, and the list goes on and on and on. So sea vegetables are definitely uh, part of this. Yeah. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, what is your opinion on probiotic supplement? And second, do you have a cookbook? <laughs> no, I don't have a cookbook. I don't have a cookbook, but there's one called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook. All right? So it's Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook by the Esselstyns. It's fantastic. All right, so if you need a cookbook, that's the one to get. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the other cookbook is, is the Rescue 2 Diet, and that's an excellent one. That's the, the son. We just uh, have a question. Who wrote the book that you said before? Esselstyn. Dr. Esselstyn. 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 He mentioned in the lecture. Esselstyn. Yeah. Um, and I can give you the reference. So, no, I don't have a cookbook. What was the other question? Probiotics. So we could spend all day talking about probiotics. Probiotics are fundamentally important. So your micro, so you are about 10 trillion human cells. You have in your gut about 100 trillion bacteria. And in standard Western medicine, we're just starting to understand the benefits of the microbiome and how it affects us. Again, I shouldn't say this in, when I'm standing on an altar, but when people say you have a shitty outlook on life, it's probably true that if your gut is messed up, your brain ain't going to work so good. So probiotics are 100% important. So what's the answer? Well, go buy some pills. No, that's not the answer. Because if I, probiotics are living organisms that you have to feed. What do they eat? They eat prebiotics. What are prebiotics? Prebiotics is the fiber that you're not digesting. So when you're eating corn chips and french fries and burgers, you're killing the probiotics in your gut. Because they got no food. When you're eating spinach and kale and collard greens and, and all those beautiful green things that we have blossoming now in our gardens, those are feeding the probiotics. So if you want to take care of your gut flora, you need to feed it. So taking a supplement isn't the answer. The other thing is fermented foods. So anybody who's interested, I'm doing a seminar tomorrow on fermented foods in Port Hope, and we're talking about how to make your own probiotic supplements at home. So you make your own sauerkraut. And two tablespoons of homemade sauerkraut is the equivalent to a bottle of probiotic supplements. Costs you about 10 cents to make or $60 to buy. Okay? So that's all you need to know about probiotics. So don't be buying supplements. Make your own. And feed your gut healthy food, which is fiber. I'll leave it at that. If anybody has any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. I'm certainly happy to talk to you. Uh, I'm not here to sell anything. But I do do nutritional consultations in my office if somebody is interested, but I don't need your business. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sell anything, but if you're curious and you need personal attention, then we can always talk, and I left some cards at the back. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Phil, for motivating us to have a healthy lifestyle. I do have to tell you, though, such a nice day today. I took two steaks out for barbecue tonight. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to eat them, but I'm going to feel damn guilty about it. So thank you very much. <laughs> but also have mushroom, zucchini, and peppers with it, just so you know. Well, that concludes the morning of our educational day. The volunteers at Faith United Church have generously made some food for our nutritional break. So I encourage you all to take some time to grab some food. We will begin our award presentation in about 30 minutes, which puts us about 12.10. So enjoy. <laughs>